Gabby and this is the Happier Life Project. Welcome to the second part of my conversation with best-selling author Ernest Holmes Fenson and I will hold my hands up. We have pinched the name of one of his books for the title of this episode, How to End the Stories that Screw Up Your Life, because that is the overarching theme of today's chat. Ernest Holmes Fenson is a best-selling author, trainer and chairman at the Institute for the work of Byron Katie. Byron Katie is a self-help guru who uses the method of inquiry to challenge negative thoughts, beliefs and stories. In last week's episode, How to Identify and Challenge Limiting Beliefs, we learned all about the work and Ernest guided me through the simple and effective process, which I highly recommend you going back to and checking out if you haven't listened to it yet. So we're going to jump now straight back in, picking up where we left off with that nasty voice we all have in our head that tells us we're not good enough, we'll never get that promotion, we'll never get that new partner, we're too fat, we're too thin, we're too ugly. You get the idea. Ready to find a healthier, happier you? Let's get started. I can see why you're so busy with clients all over the world, Ernest, and checking out both of your books. There were so many aha moments. A big one for me was about when you were talking about the voice. Yeah, it was the voice in our head that speaks to us. And because we hear it in our mind, we believe what it's telling us. And I actually, over the past couple of months, I, I've I've said it a couple of times to people where I said, I feel like I'm being picked on by myself. <laughs> Because yeah. it's the, it's like thoughts when like I'm waiting for an outcome and it's that sort of Debbie Downer that it's like it's not going to be what you want it to be. Yeah. And it, and it yeah. does feel like there's a bully. But if, it, if that voice, what you're saying, it's actually, well, it's we're disassociating ourselves from it. Then whose voice is it? Where does it come from? Yeah, I, I uh, let me take a little back road to that and okay. say that in, in contemporary um like uh, especially sort of uh, spiritual uh, um, jargon, the, the concept of of the ego mm-hmm. is seen as a bad thing and something to overcome. And and we talk about self sabotage, and we talk about there are all these negative ideas about like like there is a civil war going on in us, like a part of us is working actively against us. And this Debbie Downer voice, we imagine, oh, if it just wasn't there, and it shouldn't be there, and it's terrible that it's there, and so on and so forth. And I would like to offer the perspective that uh, it is there for a very good reason because it's part of an adaption strategy that we set up when we were young. And we, and in my experience, our system never does anything f- without very good reason. Mm. So let's say that, that um, a scenario uh, would be that I am in a family where my parents are not fully at ease with themselves. They are always afraid to be not good enough. And so whenever I stand up and as a two-year-old or three-year-old would do, look at me, look at how amazing I am. That's the starting point for all of us. It's just like, yay, I'm alive and I can do this. And yeah. then that'll, that'll, that'll trigger something in my parents who will feel, oh, that's dangerous or unpleasant or you shouldn't think too much of yourself or who do you think you are? And that reaction in them, they will, they will pull their love back from me. They won't rejoice with me in, in my amazingness. They will be like, oh, we shouldn't. No, 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 put your clothes on or, you know, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, be, don't be too happy with yourself. Possibly in an attempt to protect me against whatever, because that's their map of reality. But what happens in me is I go, oh, when I express how wonderful I am, then the, the uh, attachment people in my life, the caregivers, the important people that are required for my survival, which it is for a human, it's necessary for several years in our childhood to have some that take care of us. Then I have to adapt to that. And my adaption is to say, oh, I won't say I'm wonderful. Because if I say I'm wonderful, I'll be rejected and they will pull back from me. So I, I put this thing into myself, which is a very good thing, which is a thing that says, don't, don't say you're wonderful. Because then the, the people will not love you as much. Now, that's a very good strategy for, to adapt to the environment I am. It's just like, because I'm born in our century or, or in these days, there are, are roads with the cars, and that's a dangerous place. So I have learned not to walk out on the freeway, which is a good adaption strategy to the, to the environment I'm in. We don't say, oh, that's terrible that I scare myself at the thought of walking on the freeway. We say, oh, that's good. Yeah. 
But we say, oh, it's terrible that I scare myself from saying I'm fantastic. But actually, it's exactly the same principle. There are systems in me that are trying to adapt the best possible to the environment I'm in and protect me against danger. And they do that based on their interactions with the world. And I'm actually thinking, so just to piggyback off that, and I'm visualizing the parent, mum, dad, whoever, or the, the, you know, the caretaker of the child. Mm. And the kid is like stood up on a table being like, I'm brilliant, yeah. I'm brilliant. And so the parents like, no, 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 sit down, sit down. Um, yeah. and, but then I'm also imagining the kids stepping out without looking and there's a car coming and a parent, like we've seen so many times, grabbing the child and in the same voice of warning being like, don't do that again. So Very good. It's, it's logged the same, but actually one is to actually keep us safe and the other is something that we've learned that has been put on us from our parents. Yeah, but but I guess your parents also learn not to walk out on the street from their parents. But I mean, like the kid that's up on the table being like, well, hey, look at me, maybe just in a, nap- yeah. a nappy or whatever. Uh, some, yeah. some parents would be like, yeah, go for it. Like, live your best Absolutely. life, you're two. Yeah. Whereas others that yeah. might have been brought up differently would be like, sit down, put your top on, whatever, whatever. Um, Precisely. So, so that's going to generate two different maps of reality. Precisely. That's what you're saying. Precisely. And that will be passed down through generations in families. If we don't, if we don't actively stop it, then that's what we'll do with our children, as you're also saying. Their, their parents did that to them, and they learned a way to survive in life is to not think too much of yourself. And then they pass that on to their children, you know, sometimes consciously, mostly unconsciously, by, by pulling back or closing down if the children are too full of themselves. And the child learns, I shouldn't do that. And now you're sitting here, and you have a voice in your head, that's when you're about to say, you know what happened for me today? I, I did so well at work. I made this amazing presentation or whatever, and people loved me. You want to share that. And then the voice comes and says, oh, oh, be careful now. Don't do that. Don't because draw attention you to this, yourself. Yeah, then they'll reject you, and we don't want that, do we? And that's, that's the origin of that voice. It's a good voice in that it's just trying to protect you. The only problem is it's been fed rubbish. And so if we... It, when we start uncovering this and go, is it actually true that I that I sh- should not share about my success at work, that that's how I want to live and that I should put myself down so that so, other, so I'm not too much for others? Is that the crowd I want to be around? As we start questioning that, we begin to realize that that voice begins to become adjusted into, uh, uh, yeah, own it. Go, girl, <laughs> you rock. You know, <laughs> because we are just learning, oh, that's actually a better strategy for a good life mm. to stand up for yourself and own yourself i mean along with this would come bound lack of boundary setting potentially and 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 uh, uh, yeah sadness depression all kinds of stuff can grow out of that one if we don't do yeah. something about it and the thing to do about it is very simple question it you know don't just take it for granted because mm-hmm. your parents say also question whether to go out on the road you can't know if it's right until you've questioned it and i i hope you will come to the conclusion that going out on the freeway is a bad idea <laughs> Under most circumstances. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's good. Question it. Um, Just because you touched on ego and I did, it did make me sort of think about that as well. And then I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole and I was like, well, let's clarify what is ego. This is a definition that I found that I think most simply explains it, if you don't mind me sharing it now, Ernest. Um, And I'd love your thoughts on this too. In psychoanalytic theory, that portion of the human personality, which is experienced as the self or I and is in contact with the external world through perception, it is said to be the part that remembers, evaluates, plans and in other ways is responsible to and acts in the surrounding physical and social world. So according to psychoanalytic theory, the ego coincides with the ID and the ID is said to be the agency of primitive drives and the superego considered to be the ethical component of personality as one of the three agencies proposed by Sigmund Freud in description of the dynamics of the human mind. <laughs> and that was the simple one I found. Yes. Yeah. So it's a lot well, more complex. Um, like the word ego comes around, oh, they've got a big ego or ego in yoga is used. But I was like, what actually is ego? And it's, there's more to it than actually we think about. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I also want to say that any description of the human psyche is incomplete 
and, and has its own built in. As soon as you take something that is very organic and, and, and created by the wisdom of, of the universe and nature in its infinite complexity, and you try to simplify it yeah, and put it on, on into a structure as we humans tend to do, it will amplify some things and suppress other elements. So, so I don't think that any description of like, even the word ego is a human construct. The, 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 our, our system does not register this as separate from everything else. It's all one integrated system. Mm. And then we say, okay, this is a part that's the ego. And this is the part that's the super ego. And this is the identity. And that's fine. And this has a Freudian ring to it. Mm, yeah. and, and, and I think you also mentioned that. And yeah. so, so that's seen through uh, the, the map of reality of Freudian understanding. So that's, that's the filter looking at a human being from a psychoanalytic perspective. You, you will see that when you see it. And you will have systems of ex- explanations that correspond with what you believe. And that is effective in some areas. It works very good. Mm. And then there will be areas where it's not a good approach. And, and that's just like if we look at the physical world, we have the Newtonian understanding, which is the billiard balls and, and, and Newton's perspective, which works really well within certain frames, which is like the macro thing. And then we have developed this new idea of, of how it is, quantum mechanics, mm. which, is, which is also a description of the physical world. It's a different description and it brings out other elements and, and they operate together. It's not like one is right and the other is wrong. They are both true at the same time. The same would go for the ego to my mind. Like any description of the ego is, is fine and it has its benefits and its, its drawbacks. And, uh, and, and what is important for me with my, what I was trying to share was that instead of making it a bad thing inside us, like the, the, the voice, instead yeah. of having this inner civil war, trying to get the voice to shut up, which yes. just causes more confusion. My path is about loving yourself instead of, uh, and that's very fundamental to me. I think many people who enter the whole mental health and every other health element, uh, a lot of us enter it with the idea, I must improve myself. I must make myself better. That's a very fundamental driving force in a lot of contemporary self-improvement, it's even called, right? I need to make myself better or self-development, we call it sometimes. But, but the problem is in that is actually a hidden aggression towards ourselves, the idea that I'm not good enough as I am. Mm. So the idea is if I can make myself better, then I will become worthy of whatever it is I want, love and, and, and life. And, mm. all that. and that's an approach and, and, and it's good and it'll never overcome the fundamental building thing, which is that even the action itself is a proof that I'm not good enough. So at some point, we need to get to that point where we begin to, to, to take another strategy, which is, I love myself as I am. Mm. I am good enough as I am with all my faults and, and, and with the voice in my head and everything. And what I found is as that happens, there is a release of, of tension, both physically and, and emotionally and mentally, which allows for these things to shift. And suddenly that voice in your head becomes more like, oh, you're my protective voice. Nice. Thank you for being there. And I don't need you right now. You know, and I appreciate the work you have been doing for me day and night for 40 years. And right now in this moment, I would like to not hear you mm. which is a very different approach to to uh, to it then oh no it starts and i'm tearing myself apart right right so that's that's so instead of of improving yourself my my sort of um, approach is to discover how you love yourself that you are lovable that you are wonderful as you are and that's one of the things i like about the work of byron katie is there's room for that in there yeah whereas some other methods are more uh, sort of uh well, they're not emphasizing at least that as aspect as much. And it's become a very, very uh, important aspect to me, this self-love thing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's like a lot of people feel like it's easier said than done. And, and I think a lot of people think I'll never be able to get to that goal. It sounds so simple. Yeah. I'm good enough. Yeah. And I guess, do people fail because they maybe start doing the work, but it's not an overnight thing. It's you've got to do the work continually, probably every day in terms of questioning these thoughts and these beliefs. I know that you're a fan of um, workbooks or worksheets. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, no, worksheets are part of the work, yeah. Is it like a daily practice, like meditation? Well, well, or? Yeah, well, it is a practice, but, but I would say all, um, I, I think we all constantly do something with our understanding of ourselves. It may be talk to our friends it may be just lie alone in bed and, and cry over our misery. Uh, it may be doing some sort of practice. 
And I'm not particularly hooked on the work of Byron Katie. What I'm hooked on is don't buy everything your mind tells you, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. learn to question it mm-hmm. and, and use any method you want. And, and, and I like meditation practices that has some of the same elements of sitting there and listening or noticing what's going on in you. I like circling. I like radical honesty. I like all, uh, all, all kinds of practices that, that opens you up to, to renewing your perspective on this. Mm-hmm. And yes, for the work specifically, that is a meditation in the sense, or it's a yoga for the mind in the sense that it's not, you don't just do yoga and then you think, okay, now my body is fixed or now I, my energy flow is free or whatever. You, you turn yoga into something you do for many people once or twice a week and, and for the real hardcore practitioners, a daily activity. And in doing that, you gradually built your body into becoming both on the energy and, and the, the muscle side a better functioning, more harmonious and, and effective organism. And you don't do it to look good. Mm-hmm. Or well, some do, of course, but when you use yoga to look good, then, then there is a limit to how deep you can go. And if you use it to actually for the joy of, of the inner experience, then, then it becomes something that you enjoy doing and it, it's a source of self-love and um, self-appreciation in the very actions of doing it, taking your time to yourself and so on. And it's exactly the same with this inner work. It's like, take the time to sit down and, and it doesn't have to be like a practice of now I sit down like this. It could be just, what are you doing with your mind when you're on the bus on the way home? Like, like how, do you, how do you treat yourself there? And yes, it is a journey because all children conclude I'm not good enough. It's impossible to avoid because in many situations they aren't. It's a correct observation. We aren't good enough to do all the things the adults can do. And the adults will sometimes be annoyed with us. And we will make that personal because at a certain age, we think everything is about us. So it's a completely natural part of growing up to have this conclusion. The sad thing is if we never question it, question it and we never discover how lovable we are and how all our apparent deficiencies are the most lovable thing about us. And we continue to strive for some sort of perfection that we'll never get. And I remember a situation I was at a retreat. I had really perfected myself because I came into, I came to this with the same idea of, of wanting to be beyond hurt. So I would no longer suffer. And if I, if I could just perfect myself enough, mm. then I wouldn't be hurt by anything anyone would say. That was sort of part of my drive. And then I was at a retreat and, and a, a person, Tony, he's, he's called, uh, came up to me and said, you know, there's something about you having it so together that makes me not want to approach you. And in that moment, I realized that even if I managed to perfect myself to the point where I thought now I would be lovable for everyone, then that would become intimidating and people wouldn't want to approach me anyway. So it's a no-win situation. You can never, but what, what I could do, I realized, is I could become a real human being, just a real, authentic, messy human being with all the goods and the bads on, here I am, this is me. And those who enjoyed me would then enjoy me. And those were actually the people I wanted to be friends with. And those for whom I was whatever I believed about myself too much or too little or, or not enough or, you know, um, they would then avoid me. And that's probably a good setup. Why would I want to be with them if they actually don't like who I am, if they're just in love with my mask or persona? or? And so for me, it's been a gradual uh, relaxing and it is because I'm certainly not and there, there are many things that, that I find um, difficult to share about myself but it's it's a, an increasing relaxing into yeah this is who I am and I'm actually quite fond of who I am I, I, I kind of like myself I think I'm a nice sensitive uh, uh, caring loving person and I'm finding that's the case for everybody that that our nature our true nature is very very kind and loving and, and wants the best for everybody yes that is easy to say and difficult to do and that's where I really love the practice of the work of Byron Katie, because that practice does it. Because we can't decide now I'm lovable, because all our beliefs are in the way. It would just be putting force on top of a structure that, that, mm. that has. Instead, let's question those beliefs. And as they disappear, we discover how lovable we are. And we don't have to do anything for it. We just see it. We see, wow, that was so sweet. I did that stupid, stupid thing. And I really did it out of the kindest heart. Or even I did that mean thing but I did it because I was so scared, you know, mm. and beginning to see that in myself, I also begin to see it in others. And so when others treat me in certain ways, I don't see evil people or mean people. I see perhaps frightened people or people who think there's not enough or, mm. and, and that just brings out my compassion for them instead of bringing out my a war or struggle with them. And so life just becomes different and much easier. 
Yeah. yeah. Just kind of scratch the surface, but um, like to, to kind of wrap things up, I did want to just acknowledge, I think this is actually from uh, your book, How to Live in the Now, because I feel like everybody really suffers from worry. And you said you compared the future to that of the weather, that we can only predict it based on the present, what we know of the present, but there's actually no guarantees for the future, no yes. matter how much we might believe that there are. I just thought that was a, a really great statement. And I wondered if you had any kind of other pearly words of wisdom when it comes to worry, because again, worry can drive us crazy and the looping yeah. negative thoughts or potential outcomes that we start playing in our mind. Yes. Is it the same process? Do we ask those four questions? Yeah, because t t check it out. Why do you worry about something in the future? You're worried about your exam, right? Why do you worry about that? You worry because you fear failing at the exam, right? Mm -hmm. and, and why do you fear failing? There are some beliefs there that I have to pass the exam. If I don't pass the exam, I won't have a good future. If, you know, there, there's this structure of beliefs. And so you will identify, you notice the worry. And then you, the worry is just the mind trying to solve the problem that it thinks there is. The, the mind is doing a good job. Worry is, is, again, it's a very good mechanism to try to solve something. The problem is, that the, the, or why it's, it's, it's hard for us, is that it's trying to solve something that isn't really here to be solved right now because it's, it's in this example, a future problem, and it's trying to solve it now. So what we can do is we can look at instead, we can prepare for the exam. That's a good idea. And then we can look at this, this worry that I have. What is actually feeding it? And when we start looking at what's feeding it, we will uncover beliefs. Like, for instance, I, I have to pass the exam in order to have a good life. Let's make it very simple like that. And again, we can question that. Is it true that in order for you to have a good life, you need to pass that exam? You, if you don't pass that exam, you won't have a good life. Can you absolutely know that that's true? And here we already begin to see that it's ridiculous, you know, that passing this exam might lead to a very bad life because then I'll just get this boring office job and, and wither away. Whereas if I don't pass it, I'll travel to Colombia and I'll meet Jorge. And, and it'll bring me this amazing life of living in a, on a farm in Southern America or whatever, right? So it's just the mind running based on the map of reality. It's trying to predict the future, but it's predicting it based on rubbish. Let's question the rubbish. And then it becomes, I, I tell you, it becomes like this. Okay, I'm prepared for the exam. Maybe I'll pass. Maybe I won't. Let's see what happens. It's exciting. That's all. There's no more to it. It's just maybe I'll pass. Maybe I won't. It's no different than I'll go down shopping. In, for some people, going down shopping in the supermarket is a terribly dangerous uh, uh, idea. But for most of us, luckily, it's like, okay, I'll go shopping. And that's it. And life could be like that in, in all its aspects when we are without the belief of, yeah, I have to look good. I have, what do people think about me is important. I must pass the exam. I need These are the criterions for a good life. It's just this predicting machine that's running, trying to predict the weather and do whatever it takes to control the weather. And one of my points is you can control the weather no matter how much you try. Mm -hmm. So you need to surrender to the weather. Maybe I pass, maybe I don't. Mm. But that's not just something you can decide because you have these voices in you that want you to make it. So instead you question, can I know that this is a good instruction to me that I must pass the exam? And as that releases, then, ah, and then it becomes, oh, I didn't pass. I tried my best and I didn't pass. Now I'll go again next year and what's for dinner? <laughs> Simple as yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much, Ernest. I just want to bring it full circle now back to the title of the podcast and this episode because um, this is something that like for the new uh, series, I'm going to ask all our guests to do and that is set us some homework what is a simple project that we can do based on what we've talked about today, letting go of these old stories and beliefs that will help us on our journey to building a happier life? Like what's a simple activity that we can do to start? We what might have already covered activity? it. Yeah. I, 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 like for me, a simple activity uh, would be to just look into the work, that, that, the work of Barney. That would be, you know, go to my website or go to, go to her website. But, but in terms of not, not sort of tool-oriented uh, approach, I would say taking some time with yourself, like slowing down. When, when your mind is going crazy, slow down and look at what is it I'm actually believing. Like, like go deeper. Don't just believe what's on the surface. Look at what's feeding it. Because it's all about awareness. And the more aware you can become about what's actually going on in you, 
the more it will release, like becoming aware that there's an hour and 10 minutes and not just 10 minutes. That's what shifts it. The awareness itself shifts it. So don't buy the first thought that comes into your head. You know, question it with whatever tools you have. And I propose these tools and, and there are others and you have them, you have it all in you. So, so yeah, uh, brilliant. Where do we find you? Where do we access your books, your tools? I know there's um, stuff you can download from your website. Yeah. So the easy, the cheap, easy, the free easy thing is to go, go for my podcasts. I have like a series of podcasts, which explains this process in detail and, uh, and you just look for my, you can go to my website, which is at www.theartofbeinghuman.com. And there you can go to my podcast page and there all the podcasts are, but they are also available in iTunes and, and, and you know, everywhere these days, uh, Spotify and, and all the places we go there. Just look for my name. You can find the podcast, listen to me from one end. So that's one place. And there you can, my website, you can also find my books. And in terms of this process, it's the book called How to End the Stories That Screw Up Your Life. That is, uh, that is the relevant one. It explains this process in detail. If you're more interested in that process, you can also uh, go to Byron Katie's website, thework.com, where you can see her do this process with different people and find also there the materials for doing this. I've been doing the training in this for so many years, and the beginner's training is beginning to be a little repetitive for me. So now I'm just turning it into an online video course. I would really suggest that, that you take that course. You can do this on your own. You don't need a facilitator. You can learn to do this on your own. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I'm trying to cover in that course. So. Well, also as well, like just I'm sure for people that have listened today and also like what I said at the start of our chat, you do have such a, a soothing, warm voice, which is oh, yes, right. which is going to really help in terms of like absorbing all this amazing information. So, yeah, I would piggyback and say that if you do like to consume audio rather than physically reading a book, the audio yeah. books of your work are yes. also a great place to start yeah. too. And, and they are on Audible. Uh, yes, yes, them, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Ernest, just thank you again so much. I might actually split this into two episodes. So there's a part one and a part two because I'm, I'm thank you for being so generous with your time. Like we've <laughs> we've run quite a bit over. You're but, saying um, we've gone over time. Very good. Yeah. I, I talk too much. And look at what no. I could do with that. I could be like, oh no, I talk too much. Or I could be like, yeah, I, I like what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. I finished reading How to Let Go of the Old Stories That Screw Up Your Life last night. And I want to repeat the final sentence, which actually came from the book had finished. I think it was like your, um, it was your last words. Do you remember the last sentence you said? I don't. Oh, well, I'll have to read it then. The ripple effect of the smallest action can change the world. Mm. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd never even heard of Byron Katie before. So like this has oh, wow. really opened Great. my eyes to a whole different way of, of looking at our mind and how we can work, work through some of that baggage and that might mean that that some of your listeners have also not uh, heard about it so that's great so that spreads the word to a new a new group of people who may not know about it that's wonderful mm, absolutely and that my friends concludes my two-part conversation with the fantastic Ernest Home Svensson so thank you for making it through to the end of episode four of the happier life project and if you do want to check out more work by Ernest and there's loads to check out including the video course his audio books um, you can get to everything you need to by going to his website www.theartofbeinghuman.com and if you are suffering with your mental health there is a crisis button on the My Possible Self app which will signpost you to the correct information for immediate expert advice those of you who are listening on one of our podcast platforms the my possible self app is completely free to download so you don't need to worry about it costing you anything make sure you subscribe and leave a review if you found this episode helpful and to find and follow us on social media we are at my possible self and i've been at radio gabby until the next one do take care and bye for now <laughs>